my question for you is is pretty basic. It's so why why did you join the board of the Chesapeake Conservancy? Like what inspired you to I mean, you have a lot of duties, you have a lot of responsibilities, you have a lot of people clamoring for your time. Um why did you choose to devote the time to the board of the conservancy? And I, I just love to hear your answer. Joel, that's a great question. And typically people who are the busiest have the most to do there. <laughs> Ask more often than not to serve on another board. This wasn't such a case. Uh, I, I've been interested in conservation. I've been interested in doing what I can do to protect the environment. It sounds cliche-ish for the next seven generations, but it's in my DNA. And I hadn't had a seat at the table. And when I looked at at the work that that you and and Pat Noonan and others were doing, and when you were receptive to the comments that I would make in some of our meetings, I said, I think these guys see me. I'm I'm not invisible. So when the opportunity came to uh, came up to to be on the board of the conservancy, to me it, it was just a natural fit for the things that I wanted to do. But here to four, I hadn't had an official voice in that movement. So, so I accepted with great humility and I felt it an honor, you know, to, to, to put this voice in the room. And I might add, it, it was very, very, very warming and uplifting for people to hear what I said and to actually incorporate it into that calculus moving forward uh, to, to actualize the goals and aspirations of the Chesapeake Conservancy, the National Park Service notwithstanding, because I think we're in lockstep. I appreciate that. Um, I have a question for the chief. So we have a room here filled with partners working across the Chesapeake watershed. There's you know, dozens of people online that's watching as well. And they might have ideas on and thoughts on how they would want to work with and partner with tribes in their part of the watershed. Do you have any recommendations or advice on how they should proceed? Again, that's a great question. And I want to uh, inform you folks that the top of my first conversation with Wendy O'Sullivan is how can we engage more tribal communities to be a part of this, to feel like uh, they can help affect those changes that we need, our, our, our operational style uh, to, to protect our environment. And I immediately said, yes, this is a great idea. And we do have the Indigenous um, Conservation Council within the the mid-atlantic tribes the tribes within the commonwealth of virginia but but a simple phone call to me and i'll give you my email but uh, and for those online it's stephen s-t-e-p-h-e-n dot a-d-k-i-n-s at chickahominy tribe dot org and if you if you drop me an email, I will forward it to the tribal leaders among the federally recognized tribes and state recognized tribes within the Commonwealth of Virginia, because I think they will be receptive to that too. And I would like for, for folks like Wendy and, and Michael Slattery and Joel Dunn to know that there will be opportunities, if your time permits, that we could convene a group of these tribal representatives and have you come talk with us. So this, these are not empty words or thoughts. I'm very serious and, and just very keen to, to the question you ask. I think we can make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. I just, uh, I just want to make one observation. Um, Chief Adkins time and effort that he served on the board of the Conservancy was, uh, of course, very enlightening to our board, but also um, gave him some insight into how, you know, we as a, a nonprofit conservation organization work and some of our capacity limitations and opportunities. So it was a knowledge exchange in a sense, which enabled us both to prosper and achieve our goals uh, together. So it, if, if there's opportunity to engage tribes in your organization's boards or in advisory boards for your government agencies, I would highly recommend it because it provides additional perspective that, you know, you just 
don't have without a mentor and a friend like Chief Hadkins. You know, I had mentioned the arc of conservation in my um, uh, introductory remarks to Chief Adkins, and I really think that's something that um, the Gateways Program and the Chesapeake Conservation Partnership are helping to engineer. If you put a couple of these uh, really pithy sentences together, the arc of conservation includes equity in conservation. We need a Marshall Plan for the uh, for the Chesapeake. It, that includes preserving culturally significant property and the time to act is now. I mean, we got a great TikTok. We ought to do that together because that would like go viral, I'm sure. But anyways, those concepts I think are really valuable and really profound. And that's what we're all part of here. I think that's what brings us together. It's, I'm so proud to be a part of this group and, and to be with you today. So we wanted to, if you're supportive of this, um, open it up to the the audience here and to folks online. Um, so if there are questions here or questions from those that are joining us virtually, um, and we'll see what comes in. Looks like um, Eddie's gonna go bring it. There's a microphone coming to the to the audience. Give me some layups now. <laughs> Tip ends, okay. <laughs> for it to be personal mm -hmm. and I, I hope that you'll uh, share with us something that might nurture us as individuals. Okay. I'm interested in in uh, in your your perspectives on stewardship. Con conservation's running partner, right? Stewardship. Right. Are, are there certain values that are taught within uh, within the tribal community to your to your children uh, that relate to stewardship and how we should look at stewardship that you might be willing to share with us? You know, I'm blessed with, with a beautiful wife who has taught me how to recycle. But if you come into my house, <laughs> she recycles by the code that's on the containers that, that she uses. Uh, every day she walks a couple of miles uh, picking up trash along the highway. The sad commentary is every day there's trash along the highway to pick up. But But where I'm going with this, they need to be instilled early. In, in your child's life, because my daughter, one of my daughters used to always uh, want to turn the thermostat up in the winter and down in the summer. So, you know, if it's if, if 70 degrees is too cool in the winter, then it becomes too hot in the summer. Uh, but now that I see, see she's a grown individual, she she monitors that in a way that conserves energy and instills in her kids, uh, you know, don't be so flippant and cavalier uh, about this this thing called comfort. Opposite those folks who don't have uh, the ability to have that comfort that we enjoy. And, and her motto is, is, is if we look at air consumption uh, in a way that takes into view those po folks who don't have it, then, then we can help all of society. But to go back to your original thought, a question, we, we have been taught from day one that we are stewards of the environment. Uh, when, even when I, I would go squirrel hunting as a, as a kid, my grandmother would say now, you know, if, if you can eat 10 squirrels, go ahead and kill them. But if you can't, bring what you need. Or if you're deer hunting, you don't need to bag four or five deer. And by the way, the last time I went deer hunting, I was 17. I looked at this beautiful deer. He looked at me. He went his way and I went mine. I just couldn't couldn't kill him. And I'm not anti-game. I mean, hunting for game because it has a place. But the point that I'm making is we went still early on to take what you need and use it. Don't take more. Uh, even to to how much do you need when you pass? Where do you pass need to want? So we're taught to curb our wants and, and, and to make our desire to gain something commensurate with what our real needs are. That's a lengthy answer to your question, but we were taught from an early age to, to be aware of Mother Nature and do what we can to enhance and ensure the survival of Mother Nature. You, I hope you can get an answer out of that, but. All right. We 
me now? No. Wait. Now you can hear me. Okay. I just need to yell a little bit. All right. So this is a great a great question for I think each of our speakers. Who has influenced you or mentored you to be a voice for the environment? Again, it comes to my parents. Uh, they really did mentor me. And the overall philosophy, when I would even go to church, uh, when I'd go to tribal meetings, that always kind of insinuated itself to the conversation or, or to the sermon, uh, that it's our responsibility as the top of the food chain to protect this environment. Goodness. Um, so I'm going to share something that relates to that question and also relates to my personal connection to indigenous tribes. Um, I grew, I'm Irish, O'Sullivan, and my Irish grandmother raised us to care about the world and the environment, and, and we would go on walks and learn about the different trees and and the things that we would see in the in the space. And she would tell us this story of how at the worst times for the Irish in the famine, no one cared for them. Everyone left them behind except for one. And that was a Native American tribe that had been left behind also had been removed, had been forgotten. And that tribe sent a donation to Ireland in the worst of times, the only support that the Irish got at the time. And she told us this story. And so myself and our cousins grew up with this story and it stuck with me in a way to connect and learn about the lands and the people who were always here. And um, so that's really what started my path towards nature and waters and the environment. So I just feel like my Nini is watching and smiling that I'm sitting here with you. Um, I just, um, it actually refers to something you were just talking about um, before, Steve. I, Steve is uh, my my mom was a really big influence on me as a kid and gave me really strong conservation values and um, valued equity. She gave me value and equity. Uh, so it definitely started with my with my mom, and um, I'm trying to translate that to my kids too. Of course, I also have Irish and ancestry, the Stacks who uh, were revolutionaries in Ireland. So I carry a fire inside too. So that contributes to that passion for conservation as well. <laughs> and the red hair. <laughs> yeah, what's left of it? <laughs> Another question? Or? Uh, we've got one here. Oh, we've got a question in back. Hi, thanks everyone. Um, I joined late, so I missed the first two speakers. I'm assuming it was Joel and Wendy, no? Oh, well, I... I was very taken, um, Chief Atkins, by by your words, and and I must say that specifically one of the things that spoke to me is your your introduction at the beginning, um, saying that you know we have a voice as as Black and Brown folks in the con conservation movement, um, and and I also have to say that as you were talking about colonial genocide and and history, my my head and my heart are are in Gaza and with the Palestinian people and and so also your words about kind of demilitarization and and shifting our our praxis towards not just conserving land but also um decolonializing what we're what we're doing and other parts of the movement is it all just it's it's filling me up in in several ways so so thank you very much um i my question is with with our voice, with the voice that we do have in the con in the conservation movement, um, it's there, but it is still something that I see as as limited and a smaller voice. 
in in the conversation. And so with that being the case, it creates a situation where there are often hard conversations that need to be had. And I just wondered if you could give some wisdom or advice for for those of us who are still here to speak and be heard. Um, the conversations are not necessarily hard because we don't know how they will be met. It's more so because our voices seem to be so small. And, and again, uh, I keep getting good questions, but if you look at the three of us up here today, our, our motive, our, main, our reason for being here today was to lift awareness of the need to include voices like yours and mine in this conversation. I have a friend who often says, if, if, if you're not seated at the table, you're on the menu. So we need to be seated at the table. Uh, and sometimes it's a small voice, but it needs to be directed to the ears of people who will receive it and, and you know take it to heart. And sometimes you got to keep asking. Uh, you you got to be that pest, and I've been also also been called a pest. But but sometimes it 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 just takes persistence, perseverance for your voice to be heard. I I would I would really. And I think you articulated it very well, but but when you come to the table with these ideas in one hand or the challenges in one hand, you should have some proposed solutions and pathways forward in the other hand. Um, it, it it really resonates with the people uh, who have authority and who can provide space in the room for you. But I think you articulated your position very well. And that same thing was heard by Wendy O'Sullivan, was heard by Joel Dunn, by Michael Slattery and others. Uh, so even I would attend forums like this to ensure that somebody hears those concerns that I have, that you have. I just wanted to mention that the uh, Indigenous Conservation Council for the Chesapeake Bay was recently formulated and, and Chief Adkins mentioned that briefly, but the idea there in part was to make sure that Indigenous voices were louder and heard. Um, and so that's a new nonprofit and the executive director, Melissa Ehrenreich, is here at our conference, which is really wonderful. But that's one way we're trying to give a louder voice to indigenous communities in the Chesapeake and make sure their perspective and priorities are heard. So, you know, leveraging structures like that at the Redwoods or in, in other areas of the country has proven to be very successful. Uh, so I think there's an opportunity for us to kind of replicate some of those models here, and, and that's a great example of that. And Joel, Joel offered a, a great example. Uh, you need to enlist people like yourself and say, look, uh, we can do it. There are barriers there, but get some like-minded people in the same room, and we and you can press forward. And it it could be a room not of of brown people, black people, it could be a room of brown, black, and white people engaged in in, in what you said because because some some of those people would like to see you at the table, but to hear it from you and to have a group that says we're going to move forward, uh, we we view these obstacles as as, as opportunities and, and move forward. And sometimes you know, my wife will ask me, do you ever get tired of beating your head against the wall? I said, sure I do, but every incremental success I achieve uh, says, yeah, you got to keep on beating your head against the wall. Eddie or Aurelia, do we have other questions? Oh, we have a question. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for your guys' uh, wise words and perspectives. So something that Joel had mentioned during his speech was that, you know, this year has featured a lot of phenomena that are out of the norm and are really just putting a stress on all of us in the world. I think for a lot of people here, we all know that there's still a good fight to fight and that we have to keep going. But as an early career professional, I also know that there are a lot of people who feel like hopeless and 
for the situation, like yeah, Michael said in Gaza and um, the world is coming to such the state, how do you keep going? Like what advice would you give people that, you know, what is your motivating factor or fire? You know, and we're gonna, I'm gonna have a couple of people to help me answer that. But when we were on this journey for, to federal recognition for the Virginia tribes, it turned out that, that a lot of the tribal folks said, we're not supporting it anymore. We're not gonna throw money after this because it'll never happen. And some of us kept moving forward and we'd go to Congress and I would testify and, and tell the same story. Uh, and sometimes, I, you know, because there were are different people on these committees who hadn't heard the story. So, so we'd, we would keep telling our story. I got to know every person on the, on the Virginia congressional delegation and the many people across the delegations from other states to the extent uh, if I walk into one of the Senate office buildings or a House office building today, there are people that say, Chief Atkins, it's, where have you been? It's good to see you. Uh, but but we've got to keep keep pushing. The, the, the world situation today uh, disturbs me greatly. And, and, and my prayers every day, uh, you know, I, I ask God to touch the hearts and minds of these people. Um, why, why do they need more land? Why do they need to take land from someone else? Why can't we all get along? Why can't we work together? Uh, I, I pray for world peace and, and I hope we'll get there, but lots of times it, it, it's a result of, of one person's greed who is in a leadership position and the person is trying to establish his or her legacy by doing this or that without regard to the human life uh the human lives that it costs and and but to your question we've got to keep on pushing we've got to educate ourselves arm ourselves with with knowledge real knowledge of what we're trying to do and then take it to to ears of people who will hear it we'll find one person who subscribes to this and say, yes, we've got to make it better. And that person will have another friend. It takes a while, but we we can't give up. I mean, we, we've, we've come too far <laughs> to turn around now, but, but my heart breaks every day when I read the headlines. I've gotten to the point I don't even want to watch the news. I remember the Sudanese would see these, these poor black kids with distended bellies and, and, and flies flying all around them and uh, you know I would want us to reach out and help those people today we see folks with with severed limbs with severed arms or legs some who've lost their lives see people burying their babies and this should cause everybody in the world to step up and say we can't let what's going on in Sudan continue we can't let what's going on in the mid east and in the Far East, uh, we can't let people who are trying to cement a selfish le legacy continue to harm other people. And I'm generalizing now. I'm not saying this fits every world leader, but a lot of it, I think, stems from basic greed and avarice. I would say that... Um... Acknowledging that climate grief and climate anxiety is real is a step and finding those means to heal and, and be re nourished in, and that often is in nature and it's in community. Um, you know, there's, there's thinking happening around blue zones, the places where people are happiest and healthiest. And there are there are common threads to what that is. And it's walking, it's being in nature, it's having community, it's having fellowship, it's it's connecting to our, our heritage. Um, and all of everyone here and all the people online, you will represent all those things. You're working in those spaces. So that's what gives me a you know, just such hope is that there are remarkable organizations and big thinkers that are 
are pushing us forward. But in the process of going forward, it's actually bringing us home. It's bringing us back to connecting to the land and connecting as a community and, you know, healing in nature and in, in our um, stories. So I feel hopeful. I, I also think when I look out at this crowd and, and see these leaders that we have a need to um, meet the phrase, we are the leaders we've been waiting for. Um, the time is now and there is an urgency and the, the people that are part of these partnerships for the Chesapeake are the leaders, the change makers, the conveners and the, the collaborators that we need now. Um, so have hope and um, I'm going to pass it to Joel to help wrap us up. All right, William, I love your question. Wendy, it's a great question. Um, I have an answer from my perspective in for what that matters, but fight for what you believe in. You know, do things that are hard, not easy. Don't take no for an answer. You think Chief Adkins took no for an answer when they said, no, we're not going to recognize your tribe. He didn't take no for an answer. He never gave up, never gave up. Because from his perspective, there was no alternative. Like this was destiny. And it was really, it's really a powerful story. And something I think, you know, you can take away from this session how Chief Adkins did that and what the what his perspective was. There's great other great examples. There's this woman, a 14-year-old Girl Scout, Nethra Huruthman. She stood up to the Girl Scout leadership who was trying to sell their 500 acre forest and she protected the forest. She, she got it done. She's 14 years old and stood up for what she believed in, and she saved the forest. There's a Rappahannock tribe that saved Phone's Cliffs. They stood up to these guys that wanted to destroy the cliffs and wreck the eagle habitat. Um, you know, there's Blacks of the Chesapeake that stood up and, and, and protected um, Elktonia Cars Beach. It's such great examples of success of people who didn't let people say no. They kept going. So uh, there's some great symbols of success in this room. Um, and I think you can take heart in that. So what I'd offer to you, all of you are here today because you have distinct attributes and abilities that can help us move forward on all the things that we're talking about today. You're not here by accident. You chose to be here. And you, you're here because you care and you do have something to offer. And the collective voices in this room, it, it's there, there's just no limit to what you can do. So understand you're here because you have special talents and abilities. You're here because you believe in what we're doing. You're here because you have the will. So I commend you for being here. You could be other places, but this was important enough for you to be here today. Your presence is duly noted. And we're pleased that you're here and we believe you have the innate ability to help us move that needle to help us gain the other 3.1 million acres that we need and go beyond with you those numbers i don't recall that joel don cited with you with us working together we can make it happen with leaders like wendy o'sullivan michael slattery and others we can make it happen. Thank you, Chief. Thank you all.